everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. I'm here with special guest Coot Blackson today, and I'm so excited to get to know him and uh, more about what he's been doing. Um, the title already speaks for itself, The Magic of Surrender, and we're going to dive into what this really means and how it could affect you or your, your health or whatever you're dealing with in your life. Um, let me just do a brief introduction and then we'll get right to the show. Uh, Coot Blackson is a beloved inspirational speaker and transformational teacher. He speaks at countless events he organizes around the world, as well as outside events, including AFEST, YPO, and EO. Real familiar with a lot of those too, uh, Coot. He's a member of the Transformational Leaders Council, a select group of 100 of the world's foremost authorities on personal development, winner of the 2019 Unity Award, uh, new, sorry, Unity New Thought Walden Award. He's widely considered the next generation leader in a field of personal development, and his mission is simple, to awaken and inspire people across the planet to access inner freedom, live authentically, and fulfill a true life's purpose. I love it. <laughs> so what I always like to start with with my guest is, how did you get here, Coot? You've always had a journey, and often our journey really uh, um transforms us first right and then we go out and help to transform the world tell me a little about you where did you grow up how did you get interested in this kind of work and uh i'll let you just tell us a little bit about your story oh yeah i always felt a because born in ghana west africa my father's from ghana my mother's japanese i grew up in london <clears throat> so i feel like a citizen of the world yeah. like i'm from everywhere and nowhere i always felt um i was a very emp empathetic kid Mm -hmm. And so as a kid, I would feel people's pain very deeply. And there was a part of me that wanted to alleviate suffering in some way. I didn't know what that would look like. And so um, also I grew up in a kind of unusual environment. Why, when I was a kid, I didn't know that it was unusual. I just thought this was everyone's experience. And uh, I think that was a blessing because I grew up without a sense of limitations from the standpoint of, uh, I remember being about seven years old and being lost in the crowd. And I see a crippled woman crawling on the floor. She picks up the sand that this man walks on, wipes it on her face and stands up. Call that a miracle. And so week after week, I grew up seeing blind people see and deaf people hear. And the same man uh, who said she picked up would look at the person in the wheelchair and say, hey, why are you in this wheelchair? Stand up. Or the, or the same man would look at someone who would come in with crutches and he would say, hey, throw your crutches away. This man was my father. He was considered the miracle man of Africa, a kind of a iconic spiritual guru, teacher, uh, healer, minister, built 300 churches in Ghana, West Africa, a huge church in London, 4,000 people, 5,000 people every Sunday. So I grew up in this environment and I thought this was, you know, everyone's life and everyone's reality. And when I was age eight, <clears throat> Uh, my speaking career began because I was thrown in, into the audience at age eight and told to speak. Uh, and that started a whole relationship with communicating and speaking. When I was 14, I was ordained as a minister. And unbeknownst to me, my father had decided I was going to be his successor. We wow. didn't have a conversation about it. No one <laughs> told me. It was just announced one Sunday. And, uh, you know, I wanted to help people. But when he said it and he announced it, my heart sank because I knew that this was not my path. I knew that this was not my soul's journey, my trajectory, but I was too afraid to, I think, uh, speak my truth. I was too afraid to tell my father how I felt. My fear was if I speak my truth, if I communicate how I really feel, if I dare to be who I am, that I'll lose his love, I'll be outcast, I'll be alone. And there were literally hundreds of thousands of people in Ghana part of my father's uh, congregation that had their hopes and dreams pinned on me now that he made this announcement. So there was a lot of pressure. And I think many of us as human beings, we're, we're, we allow fear to hijack us and fear to stop us from expressing our voice and our creativity and our gifts and sharing it with the world. And so for four years, I mustered up the, uh, I kind of suppressed myself and couldn't muster up the courage to uh, have that conversation and went through a lot of internal conflict and turmoil and uh, questioning and when I turned 18 I it was a pivotal moment in my life because up until that point too I had been reading a lot of self-help books mm -hmm. my father's bookshelf were books from people like Wayne Dyer and Deepak Chopra and Marianne Williamson and so this is kind of how I immersed my my consciousness with with these with these amazing books and so when I turned 18 I felt this calling 
to come to the US. Like my soul was guiding me, like go to America, go yeah. to Amer uh, go, go to Los Angeles, specifically uh, Southern California, because this is where all of the authors lived. And I wanted to go into this field of personal development, spirituality, uh, personal growth. And uh, it didn't make sense to my mind. And I think sometimes what our soul guides us to do isn't always convenient or doesn't always make sense or isn't always logical. But I really believe that when you follow your soul, you, you, you're always guided. You end up in the right place, even though the road that you take doesn't make sense. And so um, I looked into my future at this point and I saw that I could follow the expected path. I could follow the path that was laid out for me by my father, age 20, age 30, age 40, age 50. I could be successful based on everyone else's standards. But if I didn't have myself, if I didn't have my soul, if I didn't have my own integrity, then what do I have? Like, I, I don't have anything. I don't have, what kind of success is that? And I felt such a deep sense of self-betrayal yes. and this feeling of soul suicide. And the pain was so deep that I knew in that moment, what I had to do. And that was have that conversation with my father and leave everything that I knew behind. And it was scary. It was terrifying. I had the conversation, um, had to make peace with some, some fears. Yeah. And my father and I, we didn't speak for two years, oh. which was really break. But kind of longer story short, I ended up winning a green card in the green card lottery. Uh, American government gives away 55,000 green cards in the green card lottery. I won the darn thing. And, wow. and I had this feeling, uh, we can get into that more if you want, but I had this feeling and I won it. And that for me was a signal, a sign yeah. from the universe that I was on the right path and came to the US, two suitcases, $800, you know, one in the country, just pursuing a, a kid, pursuing a dream. And when I found many of the authors and teachers that I read about, and then a few years later, I traveled, went to Israel, Monk up in India, and it was my time in India that I think really cracked my heart open to a whole nother level of, shall we say, realization, a whole nother level of freedom. And it was out of that that I wanted to, I was guided really to come back to the US and yeah. just started working with people one on one as a you know, 20 years ago as a coach before coaching was popular and just began working with people and one person came another person came and I've, before you knew it over months and yeah. years people started coming from, from around the world and uh, one thing led to the next and things just expanded and wrote two best-selling books and here we are. Wow. I love your story I knew just from the little bits that I knew about you that I would really enjoy this conversation but already my smile has helped my whole thing <laughs> It's so much part of any enlightened journey and, and no different from my own in the sense of we go, we grow up in these places and homes with expectations, right? And we kind of have to unlearn. And I too had expectations that I, I, I love how you, you said it a little different way, but I, I always say I turned down my volume because I thought it was too much and in, in my needs and some of that I turned it down to be accepted because we very young often equate love with this, um, you know, following the path that we're supposed to, yeah. or doing what our parents want us to, or being the good girl or the good boy or the, we you know, obedient son, right? Like that's the path. And there's nothing wrong with that. But what happens as we become more enlightened and find our soul's purpose, we often have to step out and have really difficult conversations. But like you said, it's either betraying ourselves um, or, you know, betraying other people. And, and that choice that you made that crossroads at 18 changed the tra trajectory of your life. Like it, it's, it, there's no way that your soul would be where you're at now doing and impacting the people. No. But you had to, you, and so I'm just to people listening, you know, you know, inside, I'm incredibly analytical. I was bioengineering and the medical doctor, but what I had to do is unlearn the mind, right. And I had to go here in that intuitive heart sense. And that's just what you're describing is going down into the body and the heart and your heart and your mind they can be in conflict and the mind, just like you said, in part of your story, it makes sense, right? There's these things in our parts of our journey where we come to a, a road where it's like our heart, our intuition says, go this way. And everything about our mind is saying, no, that makes no sense at all. That's not going to work out. But if we can put that aside and trust that deep intuition, and I think it's a God intuition, right? It sounds like there's a similar kind of a divine place that's where the joy and the miracles reside. Like what you got to see through that, through following your intuition was the miracles and the people you've helped. I just, I love it. So from there, you've been speaking and writing in that. And, and yet it's an ongoing journey, isn't it? We have to continue to kind of go from the head to the heart and be in that place. 
absolutely absolutely yeah so what do you do with a client with coaching obviously you're doing it in the book as well but how would you start with someone who says coot I'm stuck. I don't like my job. I don't like my work. I'm not happy. Um, you know, or, or for me, I'm a physician. So I'm dealing with people who are ill and they're not happy with, you know, their health. How would you start with someone like that to begin to open their minds to, to what's possible? Yeah. When I, when I work with clients, it's, it's not a, a informational process. And so I don't really give, give people advice per se and tell people what to do so much for me. Uh, it, it's really about, helping people, uh, I create processes and experiences that help people, uh, shall we say, release the layers and the blockages, the layers that we have built up over time through conditioning uh, to function and survive. As we let go of those layers uh, experientially, then I think every person just reconnects with the truth of who they are and what we've always been all along. Um, and, And so as a first place to start, for those listening, in terms of some guidance, I think one of the places that we can start and one of the things that I think keeps us stuck as human beings are all the ways that we lie to ourselves. As human beings, we so often lie to ourselves and many times we don't even know that we're lying to ourselves. We think that what we feel is what we really feel. We think that who we are is who we really are. We're not aware that often who we are and who we become is who we've been conditioned to be. And that what we are is really a set of conditioned patterns in reaction and response to things that happen from childhood and parents and ancestors and you know society and those around us. And so um, one of the first places to start is really looking at all of the lies that we tell ourselves. As human beings, in many ways, we lie to ourselves and we don't even know. And so we stay in jobs that we hate that aren't aligned with our soul. We stay in relationships where we know we're no longer in love. It's no longer right. We outgrew it 10 years ago, but we stay out of fear, out of guilt, out of comfort. And so I think if someone wants to make a start, if they want to make a shift, if they want a breakthrough, I think we have to be willing to start by telling ourselves the truth. The truth about who we are, the truth about what we feel, the truth about what's going on inside of us, just the truth without judgment, without shame, with it just, Tell the truth. Sounds simple, but not always easy. Be conditioned from childhood to avoid the truth, to suppress our feelings, to be who we think we need to be in order to get love, validation, and approval. But I think if people just start by asking themselves a sincere question, what lies am I telling myself? To me, there is no real transformation without truth. There is no real healing without truth. Like, like, like there is no fulfillment and happiness without truth. You can't be truly fulfilled and happy being someone that you're not, living someone else's version for your life. And so for me, real truth is spirit, real spiritual practice is truth. Real yeah. meditation is truth. Real therapy is truth. Real yoga is truth. And I think if we're willing to start by telling ourselves the truth, things transform, things truly shift. And so what lies am I telling myself? You have to want the truth more than you want what you have you have to want the truth more than you want what you think you want and and so many times we keep ourselves stuck with rationalizing and 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 the ways we've learned to survive and so what lies am i telling myself and i would also invite people take the pressure off of yourself from having to take action because Mm -hmm. sometimes because we're afraid of the consequence of what will happen if we speak and tell the truth to ourselves starting there the ego kind of creates a sort of unconscious defense mechanism of like confusion i'm not sure i don't know i'm confused i don't know what my purpose is. i don't know what my truth is i don't know what i really want i don't know if i really want to stay in this relationship i'm confused when deep down we're not confused there's a deep knowing we i think there's a part of us that knows everything but confusion can yeah. often be the smoke screen or the survival self-protection mechanism that kind of keeps us safe from having to own that knowing and big action and so when we take the pressure off of ourselves from having to take action, then we can just be with the truth. Uh, the truth might sound like, I'm not in love. You don't have to divorce. You don't have to break up. You don't have to make, you don't have to take any action. But just to uh, acknowledge the truth and be with the truth. I hate my job. You don't have to leave it. But yeah. j- it, just to acknowledge the truth starts a process inside, you know? And so what lies am I telling myself? What am I pretending to not know? And what is what are the lies that I'm telling myself? What is it? costing me yeah. because when we lie to ourselves there is a cost and often that cost is pain yes. i'm sure you see you said you know your physician yeah. but many times i think when we lie to ourselves it's meant to be painful 
Yeah. To me, the pain is a signal that we're not living in integrity, that there's some part of us that's out of alignment. There's some part of us that we're not paying attention to. To me, pain is a messenger, but yeah. often we don't pay attention to the message. We numb it, we distract it, we anesthetize it, we drink it away, smoke it away, eat yeah. it away, shop it away, you know, social media it away. Whatever yeah. we, have, we need to do to not feel it. And often as a result of suppressing that pain, that 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 lie that 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 truth that's not acknowledged at some point will tend to manifest as emotional pain some kind of depression or you know emotional pain it might manifest as a temporary physical ailment a backache a neck ache, a shoulder ache. it may manifest as an as some kind of dis-ease of, of like our unconscious is trying to get our attention and so i think if we're willing to just acknowledge the truth and deal with the truth and actually begin by feeling just feeling the pain yeah of the misalignment even if we don't take action that starts a process of marinating inside of ourselves then we can feel through whatever the feelings that might be there that may come up and then we can start dealing with it and moving through it so i think that's that's a place that we we can start but as children yeah. we were in touch with the truth i think as children yeah. children are very honest when we're when we're children we're free we're born free we're in touch with our essential nature we're in touch with a child will jump on the table and cry when they feel like crying they'll hug you when they feel like hugging right. you they won't when they don't they, they don't when they don't feel like it they'll run naked they don't care yep. what you yep. think they, they, they're, they're just you know they're in touch with their essence and i think that's yep. why when, when we look at a child we're reminded of that true pure yep. essential nature within ourselves which is why we melt which is why we connect to them as, as adults you know so what happened we, we're born, we incarnate, we meet our parents. Our parents, they're just doing the best that they can do based on their life and their programming, which often they're unconscious of too. And so now we're born into a preset, pre-framed pattern of conditioning. Maybe dad was an alcoholic. Maybe mom had mental health issues. Maybe they were fighting all the time. Maybe they were great people, but they just weren't able to meet our emotional needs. So firstly, we learn all sorts of strategies to disconnect, shut down and not feel. And that's where the, the sort of lying start yes. so to speak yeah. the the self betrayal starts we shut down this can not feel in order to survive and handle the pain yeah. of what's going on around us and we learn all sorts of defense mechanisms we erect walls around our hearts again to protect ourselves right and then we also learn a way of being we go into the world the sense of who do i need to be in order yeah. to get love validation approval yeah. to be loved by my dad for me yeah. i learned I need to be the good son, the mm -hmm. polite one, the appropriate one, the perfect one, the one who takes care of everyone. But in many ways, there were so many parts of my own authentic nature that I ended up betraying. And so we develop a role and a mask and a persona as a way to get that love validation and approval. We contort ourselves into a kind of shape, a set pattern that we hold on to that gets reinforced by life. And we think the version of ourselves that we've become is who we are. And it's not, it's just a conditioned pattern and program construct of what we've learned to be to function and survive. And then we live inside of that limitation, wondering why, why do I not feel free? Yeah. And, and so I think many times uh, disease or, yeah. or emotional pain ends mm -hmm. up being the manifestation of that limitation. You mm -hmm. know? And, and so for me, it's about helping people become free. And so I think we have to be willing to question ourselves like, is who I am who I really am, or is it who I've been conditioned to be? And, and the degree to which we're conditioned is the degree to which we're not free. So I think yeah. if we can become aware that we're conditioned and start observing our condition and start noticing and witnessing our conditioning and then have the courage to acknowledge, by telling the truth, acknowledge our pain. Yes. Knowing that the pain is there for a reason. The pain isn't bad. It's just a signal, alarm signal going off often in our body to acknowledge our pain, physical pain, emotional pain, and be willing to have a, create a safe space to process through and feel the, the, the layers of pain that we've learned to suppress. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where healing can happen. Mm. Brilliant. Again, just love. I'm just eating this up because it's so relevant and so relevant again to me as a physician with patients with illness. And again, my own life, it starts here about five years ago after the divorce for me, there was a big awakening. And part of that was, who am I? What do I want? Who, you know, and often what the, what the important thing there is it often takes, it doesn't always take, but it often what happens is there's some difficulty or illness or something that shakes us a little and that shaking of our stability of what we thought was secure and what we thought was who we were. 
um, allows us to start to move against those boundaries of that, you know, contorted person that we thought we were and actually say, who am I? What do I want? What does this look like? And it usually comes through some painful circumstances in my own journey. I've done a lot of work around this. And it, like I said, it was going from my head of what I thought I should, and I must, and all those kind of constructions around my childhood to actually find out what do I really want? Um, what do I really need? And having that self-compassion because there was a judge, right? There was this like strong judgment of what I should, and I shouldn't, and right and wrong. And um, not that that all went away, but there's this idea of, um, and the other thing you said is the pain, right? So when we start to, for me, I had suppressed anger, I had suppressed sadness, I was optimistic, happy Jill, that was my persona. Uh, and what I realized then as I started to actually deal with those painful things and those emotions, when they first come up, they're terrifying because they feel like a tsunami that's going to come yes, wash yes, and take yes. you out. So I was like, oh, it's no wonder all these first 40 years of my life, I suppress those emotions. Uh, right, and I remember right. when I first started feeling, there was like two weeks of ma massive sadness. And I thought, oh my mm. goodness, this is terrible. Is it ever going to end? But what happened is like you're describing as I started to allow that to flow through me, it became easier and easier. And now if I have a sad thought or an angry thought or thought that before wasn't appropriate with my upbringing, I let it come and I let it flow through me and I have compassion on myself through that. And it's not so bad. It's like a small little wave and it comes and it goes. But because of that, the physical, this is where it gets into me as a physician and patients and my own health, the physical manifestations of suppressing those emotions are too great of a cost to pay. Yeah. I had cancer at 25. I had autoimmune disease at 26 and other things. And I realize now that some of the cost of my suppression of who I really was and my own emotions was illness like cancer. And it's not every case, but a lot of physical ailments can be related in yep. some part to exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, for sure. For sure. The body, the body has an intelligence. The body doesn't the body. lie, right? The body doesn't <laughs> lie. The body communicates to us. Yeah. Yeah, sure. yeah. And like you said, I loved what you said. So for those listening who maybe do have pain or illness, I'm not saying it's all caused it's your fault or anything like that. But I'm just saying those mess, those are messengers and they're trying to, it's almost like, Hey, for me, if I think messages. about my own body, my own body is like, um, excuse me, Jill, can we have your attention? Because you're not treating yeah. us in the way that you should. And yeah. it took me years to really realize that, but I wasn't mm -hmm. really true to myself. And my body was trying to get my attention through this manifestation of illness. And, uh, and it took you know, some of that to, to get that to transform into a different place. So yeah. love all of that. Tell me about the art of surrender and the magic of surrender, because I completely agree with you. I want to hear um, how can we, because truly that embracing of uncertainty and that truly flowing with life and trusting that everything is meant to be, and is going to take us where we're going to, where we're supposed to go is hard, right? But it's also where the magic, where the things that we experience that we can, I consider miraculous, that's where it happens. It's on the edge of surrender. So tell me more about surrender. Yeah, I think first I want to say, oh, yes, on one level, it, it seems hard mm -hmm. and I will agree. Yes, it's hard. It seems hard, mm -hmm. but I'm going to actually, I'm, I'm also going to preframe it to say it seems hard. And in fact, Surrender is really what is most natural for us as human beings. It's just we've been conditioned. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's because we've been conditioned to hold on in the ways I just shared. You know, we've been conditioned to hold on. And then we hold on so tightly to this way of being, this survival mechanism, this person that we think we are, that we've become, that we've learned to be based on avoiding pain, getting love survival identity that uh, i'm making a fist right now for yeah. those listening and i'm holding on so tightly holding on so tightly holding on so tightly now holding on is actually hard yes but the more we hold on the more normal it starts feeling but in fact letting go surrendering it, it is, is the easiest thing it's just that we've been conditioned to hold on to avoid pain to function survive get love validation and approval and so the degree to which we're conditioned is the degree to which we hold on. The degree to which we hold on is the degree to which we tend to be identified with, our, with the program and the set of patterns that we've become. And to me, this is ego. Ego is not a thing. It's a process of identification. And that process of identification, that idea of who we believe ourselves to be, and that holding on sense of identification is, that's the aspect of ourselves that resists and for the ego yeah. the self that we perceive ourselves to be 
surrender can seem difficult because the ego's job, what we think we are, that we're not really, the ego's job is to reinforce its existence and survive. The ego's job is to protect us, to make sure we never feel hurt like we were hurt when we were five, when we were seven. We never feel that helpless again. And so all of a sudden, at age five, we learn to, to, to sort of become over analytical let's say or we learn to shut down parts of our hearts yep. so we learn to be a certain way so we never so we weren't hurt by dad's or mom's rejection and now it worked for us when, when we were five but now we're 25 right. and we're 35 and we're 45 and we fall in love and now our heart is closed and our heart doesn't want to open because we're afraid the ego is like i'm not gonna let you open your heart again because if you open your heart again and you surrender to the love that's in your feeling you're gonna get hurt you're gonna be abandoned you're gonna be rejected no so the ego's job is to protect us the ego's job is to make sure we don't get hurt again. When we understand the nature of ego, when we understand the purpose of ego, and when we start understanding that we are not ego, the collection of patterns that we identify with, it starts changing our relationship with ourselves. It starts changing our relationship with life, and it starts transforming our relationship with surrender. So it's ego that resists because ego Ego wants everything and everyone to change, but it doesn't want to change. Yeah. And, 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 and when we understand the purpose and the nature of ego, then I think it starts freeing us up to have, to relate to ego differently, knowing we're not it, but also it can start freeing us up to relate to it with much more compassion yeah. because we understand like, ah, oh, the reason I'm resisting, the reason I'm holding on so tightly, the reason I'm afraid of questioning myself, the reason I'm afraid of letting go, the reason I'm afraid of acknowledging the truth, it's survival it's a beautiful intention and so when we understand that then we can hold ourselves with love and compassion and kindness and understanding and reassurance and we don't have to force ourselves to surrender or make ourselves surrender we can just hold ourselves yeah. with that compassion and those young parts of us that learn from a very young age certain survival techniques and mechanisms that are often outdated and what's that's happening in that safety and that compassion is the surrender slowly, gently kind of starts happening. Yeah. And that's sort of a deeper sense. But just to, to kind of have a frame for the conversation about surrender, I believe that surrender is the most powerful thing that we can do as human beings. I really believe that surrender is the password for freedom. I really feel that surrender is the key to your next level, is the, is the real secret to manifestation. In our culture today, we've been programmed to believe I think mistakenly, misconception that surrender is weak, that surrender is passive, that yeah. if you surrender, you're going to be taken advantage of. If you surrender, you're going to be a doormat. If you surrender, you're going to be a victim. If you surrender, you won't manifest your goals, dreams, and desires. If you surrender, you're good. It, it means giving up, waving the white flag. It, it, it means you're going to get less in life. Yeah. And what I'm really saying in the magic of surrender is, what if you didn't get less? Yeah. In true, authentic surrender, what if you got more? Like more than you could even have projected and visualized and goal set and imagined from the limited perspective of your ego, because no matter how brilliant the ego is, our egos are, our minds become, it's still limited because ego is limited to past experience, which is conditioned. And so a life that is lived inside of the mind or the ego alone is still a limited life. And so surrender is when you take the limitations off of life. Surrender, it, it, every great person, Jesus, Buddha, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, um, Mandela, Martin Luther King, Bruce Lee, Bob Marley, Muhammad Ali, I mean, you, you name it, anyone who did was great in, in a sense, they all surrendered themselves. They yeah. surrendered themselves to a mission that was bigger than themselves. They surrendered themselves to life. They surrender themselves to the divine. They surrender themselves to the universe. They surrender themselves to the deep calling of their soul. And in that surrender, they transcended their own ego. They transcended yeah. their own human limitation. They went beyond personal power. And they were able to tap into a dimension of life that was infinite. They were able to tap into a dimension of life. And life began to flow through them and use them and live through them, perhaps even in ways that they could not have even imagined. And so the magic of surrender, magic is that which is beyond your mental capacity to imagine what's possible, beyond your wildest dreams. So what if you got more love, more joy, more like what you couldn't even imagine? To me, we all want the magic. When I ask people who wants more magic, 
yeah. all the hands go up. But then when it comes to like surrendering, very few hands go up. And, and so surrender is the password to the magic. And the degree to which we surrender, let go of that which isn't aligned, is the degree to which we open ourselves to the magic. And so surrender is to let go of control, yes. or I should say the illusion of yes. control. And control is that master addiction, ego's, ego's uh, mechanism, right? To control yes. everything, because I control everything, I won't get hurt. So mm -hmm. surrender is to let go of control. Surrender is to stop trying to force and manipulate life to fit mm -hmm. our limited idea of what we think it should be, where we try to make that relationship happen, even though it's not happening. We try to make that career happen or that goal happen, even though it's not really aligned, you know? So when we, when we let go of manipulating and forcing life to fit our limited idea, we let go of the idea of who we think we should be, the idea we think life should, so that we can truly be available and open and, and willing and receptive to the life that is authentically seeking to happen. You know, and, 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 and I think in so many ways, without attachment to our ideas of how we think things should be and life should be and people should be, we're not aware, but we're often limiting life. Yeah. We're limiting the infinite. And so surrender is to take the limits off and mm -hmm. to let life lead you and to be fully available to the mm -hmm. magic. That's yeah. when I think miracles happen that often surprises. And if you look at, I think the best things in life, many of the best things in life, we did and plan them they just happened in the process of living life itself and, and and even when things didn't go according to plan and things didn't manifest how we wanted them to if we look back how many times did they work out better than we imagined or even if 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 some like if someone looks back and go looks back at a relationship that you really wanted to have to have happen let's let's use this as an example if you think of a relationship that you were so sure about a soulmate you felt you met your soulmate the person you're going to spend the rest of your life with you know and I, I remember i met someone 20 years ago she was amazing i'm like this is the one i'm going to spend the rest of my life with this i couldn't imagine being with anyone else and if you think back to that person yeah and then you broke up and then now maybe from the perspective of today you look back and you go wow god yeah <laughs> god that didn't happen right so yeah. when yeah. things don't happen from the perspective of the mind or the ego it seems some way, it seems a certain way, it seems like a failure, but from the perspective of the soul, you know, it's a blessing, it's, mm. it's grace. And, I... and so the, the ego is limited. And so surrender <laughs> is the willingness to trust. Like yeah. even when we can't see to trust, and even when we don't trust, it's still unfolding for our good because even when things didn't work out, you might look back and go, wow, if I didn't lose my job, if yeah. I didn't break up with that person, I wouldn't have moved back home. And if I didn't move back home, I wouldn't have met my, my soulmate right. today. I wouldn't have, this wouldn't have happened. That wouldn't have happened. So I think life has an intelligence that mm -hmm. has, that is beyond us because oh. life has been around for billions and billions and billions of years. And I think that's, that's the magic. It's just a willingness to, to trust life. And Absolutely. I, I so, again, so agree with you and I can talk my own life. I, I know my ex-husband would agree with this as well. Our divorce what, for both of us was the beginning of us really awakening. And we now are great friends in different, you know, not in relationship, but uh, friends and respectful. And we both see how the power of that divorce really transformed us into a much better version of ourselves and it would have never happened. And it was hard. It wasn't easy at the time, but now looking back, it's one of the best things that happened. And I think about your, um, your analogies with letting the surrender, allow the magic to happen. And so many of the really special things in my life, I'm just getting ready to publish my own book and working on a documentary and both of those things, the divine gave me the, the vision seven or eight years ago on the book. And I just, it was funny because I remember having a, a really intense retreat for about you know, eight, four to six weeks where I was just delving into who I was and where I wanted to go. And I, I felt this, like, come to me, you're, you're supposed to write your story. You're supposed to write your book. And I remember literally in tears talking to God and be like, God, who am I? I don't know what I'm doing. What if nobody reads my book? You know, I don't know what I'm doing. I can't write. And that's the ego, right? That's the ego giving excuses, but I surrendered. And I remember just hearing my soul, you know what? It doesn't matter if no one even reads it. It matters if you follow your path, your journey, you're supposed to do this and let me take care of the details. And what happened in the next seven years was so many chapters were written. I couldn't have written it at the time, but I had to wait and surrender to the timing. And the timing now is, is much better than it would have been seven years ago. But during that, high, that time, I just kept it in my heart, knowing that it would happen. I had faith, complete faith that when the time was right, the resources, the people, the publisher would all 
come in the in the way that they were supposed to and it did and it's way better than I could have planned and the stories that I can tell now through that last seven years wow. are so powerful and profound that I would have never had that had I tried to do it in my own strength seven years ago and then the wow. documentary just a year or so ago I'm just sitting in my chair meditating and um it was during COVID and I thought, you know, people are no longer reading as many books, they're on screens and I'm still going to write my book, but I wonder if I'm supposed to do something on screens. And I just had the, the vision, you know what, do a documentary. I have no experience. I'm not a producer. I have no experience at all, but I'm like, okay, I'll do it if you've helped me out here. And I just started moving forward within seven days. I had producer, director, executive assistant. And within three months, we had investor who funded the full project. And that would have never happened if it had been in my own power. It was literally surrendering mm -hmm. and trusting. And then just like showing up every day with like the wonder of a child and saying, what's going to happen today? What miracles do I get to see today? And living that way. And again, I'm still in the process. I don't have it all made, but I love the freedom that you talked about because I used to live this way. And I'm showing a yeah. fist for those of you listening. And I was analytical controlled. I made my to-do list. I made my five-year plan, my 10-year plan, uh -huh. right? Nothing, and then, and that, here's the thing, nothing wrong with that. Just, yeah. just so, so people are clear, just to clarify, I think this is important to clarify for people. It's like the surrender mean you can't set goals. The surrender no. mean you just sit there. <laughs> no, to, just to be clear, I think surrender is... It's about, see, the old paradigm is you ask yourself, what do I want? What do I want? What do I want? You make plans, you make plans, you make plans based on your own limited yeah. sort of perspective, okay? And you can manifest that way, but it will often end up limited because we mm -hmm. get so attached to the right. outcome being the outcome. And sometimes the goal is not the goal. It's just a right. necessary evolutionary carrot that takes us on the journey that we yep. need to go on so that we can grow and evolve. And that's sometimes the blessing. And, and, and so in surrender, you ask a different question. What is, what is, it, what is it that life is seeking to express mm -hmm. through me? What is it that the universe is seeking to express through me? What is the deepest expression, the deepest impulse of my soul that is seeking to express? And then you align with that. Mm -hmm. As you align with that deep impulse of life, that deep intention of life, then when you, when you get that vision, when you're clear, like, this is what's true. This yeah. is the documentary. This this is the book. This yeah. is the business. This is the project. Not what you think you should be doing, right. but what's what's most seeking to express from the depth of your being, that unconditioned part of your soul. Then you can align your thinking, your strategy, your ego, your plan, your mind. Ego is now in service to your soul. Yeah. And then you can take action, full action. So surrender isn't just sitting around doing nothing. Right. That's laziness. Surrender is not an abdication of responsibility. Right. And, and it's not an excuse to just, ah, whatever's going to happen. I'm just going to go with the flow. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily just surrender. Right. Surrender is to feel deepest truth. Align with that. Give 100 percent. But don't be attached to the outcome. And I think that's the art when you're not attached to the outcome, but yes. you're involved fully and showing up fully trusting that life will lead you. Yes. Life will sh as you as you are in action, life will lead you yeah. life. It's oh, sure. knowing the what your soul is is supposed to do in the world. Like I loved your bio because a lot of those things I relate to inspire and encourage and love are, are really what I'm my soul is supposed to do, right? It doesn't matter. But the how, you let the how develop itself. You let the how you're supposed to do that come about and manifest in your life without an attachment. It has to be this way, right? Yes. And I think that's exactly what you're describing. Yeah, that's the openness where you give hundred yes. percent, but you're yeah. not like it's got to be, it's got to be this, like, like for instance, the magic of surrender book mm -hmm. was not the book I thought I was going to write. Yes, I love I, it. I had other plans. <laughs> to be honest, I wanted to write a different kind of book. And I uh -huh. sat down with an entire whiteboard of ideas, hundreds of brilliant ideas, but none of, at the end of the day, if I was really honest, if I was yeah. really, this is where honesty came into play. Yeah. If I was really honest, none of those felt true. Yeah. None of those felt authentic in my own integrity. Yeah, I could have written about yeah. them. Yeah, I could have. It could have been a nice idea, but it didn't feel aligned. The only word when I looked at that whiteboard that felt true was surrender. Mm -hmm. And that's when I knew, like, yeah. this is the book that was seeking to be written, not necessarily mm -hmm. the book I wanted to write. Yeah. And when I got my ego in alignment with my soul, that's when the magic happened. And that's when everything started to unfold. You know? mm -hmm. So. I had to surrender to the book about surrender. And, yes. and, and, and I think when we're able to live in that harmony, you know, yeah. ego in alignment with soul, that's when, that's when we're in the flow of life and nature and life supports itself yeah. through the fulfillment 
of that vision and intention. And so I, I, I would say that also our goals, our goals don't just be, I have chosen us. Yeah. Your goals choose you. And if Absolutely. your goals choose you, they don't belong to you. If they mm -hmm. don't belong to you, they belong to life. And mm -hmm. if they belong to life, then life knows how to fulfill itself through you. Mm -hmm. Your job, my job is to surrender, is to say yes, do our part to show up. Yeah. up. And that's when I think life does the rest. That's when life begins to manifest. When we get out of our own way and we say, okay, I feel the vision. I feel the calling. I'm going to follow it. I'm going to, I'm going to ride this wave because the wave is moving and, mm -hmm. and I don't have to make the wave. And many of us right. are so uh, uh, worried about how do we go to the ocean mm -hmm. like, with a surfboard and we say, well, how do I make the wave? Right. If I, if I take a hose and I, and I make a wave with water, then uh, no, the wave yeah. is the wave and the ocean is the ocean. And I think we start learning to, to catch the wave that's authentically ours. Yeah, I love that because even with the divine, sometimes we'll have a conversation, me and and the divine, and I'll be like, you know, it's your reputation on the line. I'm here, I'll do whatever you want, but it, ah. ultimately, you have to, you know, like that. I, I kind of like to let you know, let that go because it truly. One of the things you said that I want to, um, before we wrap up, that I think is really important. You talked about self compassion, and I found that to be just core with healing, right? Like you just. But I also find if I want to love people, my patients and my friends and family, and like truly unconditionally show them that kind of love and acceptance and give them a place where they can transform. Um, I can only do that if I start with that compassion to myself, because we often reflect the if we have self-loathing or judgment or those things to ourselves, we're going to project them on those we love. Do you want to talk a little bit about like why self-compassion is so important? Because I think that's a core too of what you're. Yeah, I think it, I think it becomes uh, a little difficult to truly love other people if we're hating ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can to a degree, but it's limited, you know. Right, and, and, right. and and I think the more we're able to embrace those parts of ourselves, mm -hmm. <clears throat> the less we will project them outside. Yeah. When we reject parts of ourselves, mm -hmm. when we hate parts of ourselves, when we deny parts of ourselves, we will often then project that onto other people. Yeah. And then as a result, when we see them in other people, we will judge them, mm -hmm. we will blame them, we'll make them wrong. But many times when we see other people, they're reflecting to us, reflecting to us those parts of ourselves that we haven't made peace with, we haven't acknowledged. We we haven't brought compassion to so it's hard to be compassionate to them when mm -hmm. we're not compassionate to those parts of ourselves but what i found is well, we truly bring loving and acceptance and healing and healing is the application yeah. of love to those parts of ourselves yes. that are hurting and when we bring healing and compassion to those parts of ourselves then we project less then when we see someone being egotistical or being selfish uh -huh. or being you know out of integrity or being a certain way, fill in the blank, then we're much more able to have compassion for them knowing they're in pain because we've embraced and we've acknowledged that part of ourselves. Yeah. And, mm. and I think, I think that, that's the foundation. Really. Uh, Self-love is the foundation. Yeah. And, I, and I ultimately agree. all relationships are a mirror manifestation of our unconscious. All relationships mm. are a mirror manifestation of us. And, and, and to me, there's no real relationship out there. We're in relationship with parts of ourselves that is projected out there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so the more we love ourselves, I think the more we will be able to hold the space and love what we see out there in the world. Yeah. Wow. And we need that more than ever in our world. So where can people find you? Where can they get your book? Tell us a little bit, because I just love talking to you. I could go oh, in a whole, you. I could go hours, <laughs> but I know. Um, uh, so yeah, the book is available on Amazon. That's that's one. Uh, a special free event I'm doing, depending on people listening to this conversation, uh, July the 12th through the 19th, an entire week, I'm mm -hmm. doing a, a free event online called the Surrender Summit. I want to invite everyone to register for free and share with your friends, Summit. Dot com. Okay. That's the surrender summit dot com. Uh, you can register. I'm bringing some of my friends together on that summit. People like Neil Donald Walsh of Conversations with God, John Gray, Barbara DeAngelis, um, Martha Beck, Dr. Sue uh, Mortar, John D. Martini. As a, there's, there's about 20 people that are going to also be a part of the, the, the week long event. So the surrender summit dot com. Um, for people that want to go deeper, you can check out my website, Coop Blackson. Um, Twice a year, I do an event in Bali. It's 12 days. It's uh, perhaps my signature event 
where we take 20 people and we go on a deep transformational journey together. And it's life changing. It's profound. It's, it's, uh, it's very special. It's called Boundless Bliss mm-hmm. Bali. So people can go to www.boundlessblissbali.com. Perfect. And I'll include all those links wherever you're listening. Coot, it was absolutely my pleasure to get to know you. Um, We'll include all these links. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your um, desire to change the world through inspiration and all the things that you do. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it.